Can you imagine being the guardian of the Redeemer of the human race? That you had the specific task of being an adoptive father of Jesus and the protector of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Welcome to MaryCast. This is Dr. Mark Mervali, Professor of Theology and Mariology at the Franciscan University of Steubenville. And we're going through in our Mariology series, Our Lady in the New Testament. But in the infancy narratives of St. Matthew, you cannot uh, simply pass by the significance of the role of the guardian of the Redeemer. And we're going to see how uh, with, with Mary and Jesus as the ultimate protector of the Holy Family, St. Joseph truly merits what the Church has given him in terms of a title and a role, that he's the patron of the Universal Church, and that in the order of our veneration, he should be first after Mary. So let's go to the New Testament and let's go to the infancy narratives of St. Matthew. We find in Matthew 1, uh, 18 and following, the betrothal of Mary to Joseph. Now, it's important to understand in Jewish law that betrothal is really the first step of marriage. Uh, step one is betrothal. Step two is to bring the spouse into the home of the husband. But betrothal is not like engagement in the Western world where it can be broken uh, without really getting interior to the issue of marriage. Uh, no, betrothal for the Jewish people was step one of marriage. So when Mary and Joseph are betrothed, we then have Mary going to uh, An Karim, what we know as the visitation, to serve Elizabeth. And so for three months she's serving Elizabeth. Um, I often mention to my students at Steubenville, if there was ever a great excuse not to be a servant, Mary had it. Well, I'd like to come and help you, Elizabeth, but I'm actually pregnant with God. Uh, and yet she serves. She serves, she does her duty as a member of the family. And that's why the mother is always the greatest example of service under the example of Jesus, of course, who, who empties himself to be servant for us, as uh, Philippians 2, 5 through 11 tells us in that canticle of kenosis. But uh, Mary comes back, and being around the fourth month, uh, her pregnancy is now visible. She's showing, if you will. Joseph then goes through his ordeal, and this is uh, in Matthew, 19, uh, Matthew 1, 19 and following. The ordeal of Joseph regarding the virgin conception of Jesus in the womb of Mary. How do the fathers of the church talk about this ordeal of Joseph? Well, to synthesize, it's this combination that Joseph knew that Mary, in her purity and goodness, could not do anything wrong, at the same time, Joseph could not deny that she was with child. So you have a contradiction in the mind of Joseph that he struggles with. Some of the fathers of the church said that Joseph's temples grew gray in those three days of the ordeal. Uh, whether that's literal or not is, is not as important as the fact that Joseph goes through really uh, a passion in his own right of, of what to do. Now, Joseph decides to divorce her quietly, Scripture tells us. Realize, my friends, that when Joseph decides to do this, he is already showing himself the just and the charitable man. Why? Because under Jewish law, Joseph had two options. Option number one is that Joseph could have her stoned to death, have his wife stoned to death under the auspices of infidelity. If Joseph had Mary stoned to death, it would all be on, on Mary's guilt. All the culpability would be on Mary. When Joseph chose option two, which is to divorce her quietly, Joseph incurs some of the guilt for the child that Mary bears. And Joseph, of course, being the just man and the innocent man, know, knows he has nothing to do with the child in the womb of Mary, and yet Joseph shares the, quote, guilt for the Christ child. Uh, and of course, the angel comes and saves the day. God the Father sends the angel, which makes it clear to Joseph that um, that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Spirit, Matthew 1.20. So, Joseph is the just man, and then Joseph is graced with the revelation of the angel. Now, let's look at what Mary does through this process. Mary remains silent. 
Mary does not defend herself. Mary trusts that the Father who made her pregnant through the power of the Spirit will also be the Father that protects her. Now, for you and me, this is very difficult in our present time of self-defense, of justice, even of advocacy, of, of, of lawyers and lawsuits. Mary remains silent and trusts in the Father. And the Father comes through with the message of the angel. And so the silence of Mary bespeaks her sanctity, bespeaks her trust, bespeaks her total abandonment. In these next three passages in the infancy narratives, and I'd like to take these together because they have a similar theme, we have the arrival of the Magi. This is Matthew 1.20. And scripture says, quote, Going into the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they fell down and worshipped him. This is followed in Matthew's infancy narratives with the flight of the Holy Family into Egypt, where Joseph was again instructed by a dream to, quote, take the child and his mother and flee into Egypt. Matthew 2, 12. Followed thirdly by the return of the Holy Family into Israel, where Joseph is instructed to, quote, rise, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. What's significant about these three is that Scripture talks about the child and his mother. Even when an angel is instructing Joseph to take the Holy Family away from Israel and to return the Holy Family to Israel, the angel says, take the child and his mother. What's significant about this? First of all, the unity of the child and the mother, but also the fact that the angel does not say, take your child and your spouse, but the child and his mother. This bespeaks the virginity of Mary. This bespeaks, again, that Joseph is an adoptive father, not a natural biological father of the child. And it also says very powerfully that Joseph is the head of the Holy Family. Not the incarnate word, not the seed of wisdom and the mediatrics of all graces, who's, both of whom are immaculate, but Joseph fallen but redeemed Joseph. God respects the authority of Joseph. And so, by the way, does the Holy Family. Mary obeys Joseph. St. Thomas Aquinas says it so beautifully that God the Father must have taken a spark of his divine heart and put it into the heart of Joseph so that Joseph would have the boldness to have authority over Jesus. Otherwise, Joseph's humility would keep him from ever uh, exercising any authority over God himself. But God the Father put a spark of his heart into the heart of Joseph, so Joseph would do this as a true adoptive father. And Thomas says, St. Thomas says that, that the Father also put a spark of, of his heart into Jesus so that Jesus would really see Joseph as a true father, even though he was not the biological father. So that's the unity of the heart of Joseph with the heart of Jesus. And St. Augustine tells us also that as Joseph was to Jesus the head, Joseph should be to you and me members of the body. That we should see Joseph as our spiritual father. We should pray to Joseph. Joseph is the patron of the universal church. He has the strongest intercessory power after the Blessed Virgin Mary. So if we haven't taken up the challenge of St. Teresa of Avila, the great doctor of the church in prayer, and the challenge is, if you've not asked something from St. Joseph, try him, because he will come through. Then we're all called to discover the powerful intercessor, uh, intercessory power of, of Joseph, the guardian of the Redeemer, and the foster father of the mystical body. This is Mark Miravalli with Mary Cast. Have devotion to St. Joseph. It'll keep you closer to Jesus and a greater love of our Blessed Mother and a real understanding of Holy Family, which we need today. Stay with our series. God bless you.